I'd like to welcome, first of all, up, um, these last presentations uh, for the last part of the day, of course, are a 20 minute one, so short chapter and sweet. Um, but first of all, up, I'd like to welcome Stuart Christen. Nice, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Stuart Weston. I work at the Auckland University of Technology in the Institute for Radio Astronomy and Space Research. I'm going to be presenting some work we've been doing back in the last year and this year uh, between ourselves and also with Catalyst. So, I'll pop down the names of the various people. It's not an extensive list, but we'll say these are the main participants who've contributed to this work. So, to start off with, um, basic radio astronomy, what it is I'm trying to do um, when I say data processing. So we predominantly do very long baseline interferometry at Walketh. And basically we have two antennas receiving radio noise from this some distant radio objects out there in the universe. Um, we record the data or we send the data real time over the network. And we bring it to a center that we call the correlator, which you can see down there in the bottom of the slide. And what I'm looking or what I'm interested in is um, being part of um, doing correlation and further processing, rather than just operating a telescope. Now, the scale of our problem. So, top left slide, you can see our two dishes of water, we've got the 12 meter and the 30 meter. So that's two antennas, one baseline. Um, very simple, 300 meters, nothing too difficult there. So, on the graph, you know, two antennas, one. Six antennas, that image is the compact array in New South Wales, in Australia. There's actually six dishes. I, the image I took there, the picture, there's only five, sorry, only four there in the picture. Um, the other one's way out, six kilometers away, providing the next extended baseline. Six antennas, we now have 15 baselines, so you can see how it's scaling. Bottom picture, that's ASCAP, that's the precursor to the SKA, the building in Western Australia. And there you see 36 antennas, we're now over 600 baselines. And basically, for each baseline, we need one computer. So the problem scales quickly and fast. Traditionally, correlators around the world, they went out, they bought a big, huge hunk of iron. Incredibly underutilized, very, very expensive, you need people to care and feed. I'm not going to get a research grant in New Zealand to go out and buy a piece of kit like that. Um, and it's a waste of money, just sat there doing nothing very long, very much. So, not good. Um, this is where I like to push Rians. They've been fantastic. Um, they've listened to us. Um, that was the situation before September 2016, 40 gigabits per second coming into the country. That was awesome even then. Um, most of the international people we work with, they were not looking at those data rates. <coughs> After September, 100 gigabits. So I'm laughing. I'm really, really happy. I've now got to fill that pipe for them. Um, so that's something I'm working on. But how can we use that 100 gig? How can New Zealand be involved in doing data processing for astronomy? And this is where we started thinking about cloud. Now, this is where I'm getting a little bit more technical, dealing with the data sets here. So, on those images of radio telescopes, I talked about Walkworth. Um, this is another two-station experiment we did with Hyder Stock in South Africa. So that is very, very long baseline from But it's only one baseline. Um, 12 scans, 5 minutes, we're talking in the order of half a terabyte. The next one down, that experiment was done using what we call the Australian Long Baseline Array. So you can see the dishes there, the compact array, Hobart, Lopez, Sedona, Walkworth and Parks. And then we've got 15 baselines. And I only took a subset of the data. Um, 1.5 hours, and I think that's, I'm trying to remember now, that's about four and a half terabytes. So we, we do deal with big data rates. Just to give you a little bit of science, um, the experiment with Hardy Beanstalk, as you can see the image on the left, people always like astronomy pictures, okay, they're not quite Hubble Space Telescope pictures, but the one on the left, what we're looking at is what we call methanol masers. So these are highly energetic gaseous clouds in our uh, galaxy where star formation is taking place. And we all know about lasers. Well, we also get other things that do the same as a laser, only in different frequencies. 
In this case, we call it mazing, because it's in microwaves. But it's the same thing, it's a natural phenomenon, which I find quite staggering that you can get a natural phenomenon producing something like um, a laser, in this case, a maser. So what we're looking there with the long baseline is we're trying to resolve very small parts of that gaseous cloud. The one on the right, the experiment we did with Australia, um, this actually led to a nature paper last year. What we're looking at is what we call a blazar. So that is a galaxy that all of a sudden lights up very brightly over a very short period of time. Short period to us being months. And also in conjunction with this, they detected the neutrinos from this event um, down in the Antarctic, and that's what led to the nature paper, the fact that we caught the blazar and they call the neutrino event at the same time. So, traditionally, um, correlation, what do we do? We have a head node, um, receives the data. Um, so, on the diagram on the bottom, uh, the um, things on the left, the data streams, the FX manager, they would normally work on the head node. And those other processes we call core 1 to M, which would be equivalent, so M would be our number of baselines. Um, they would be in working nodes. Um, and that's traditionally how we've been doing it to date, and that would all be sat on a humongous piece of iron. Um, using local servers at Walkworth, um, I, did, I just wanted to benchmark these tests, so this was using the LBA experiment uh, with the uh, six antennas, and here I should say speed up is where we save the observation time, so that's the 1.5 hours, divided by the time it takes to correlate or process in the environment. Ideally, what we want to get into is at least a speed up of one, if not better, if we can, because we'd like to do it in real time. Um, so I did it at Walkworth on nothing spectacular, there's two standard servers, and nothing brilliant about them, and I got to approximately 0.5 speed up. I then tried doing distributed, so we had one of the servers in Walkworth and one of the servers in the city campus, so that's coming down from Walkworth on 10 gigabits into the city. Um, and 100 gigabits and then out to our campus. Now this is where latency hits us, so our speed up has now dropped down to about 0.3. So that was distributed computing. Um, just to give you an idea, this just a graph to sort of show the data flows there. So you can see the data flows coming from our campus, um, sorry, from Walkworth, um, down through Rians and then into AUT. So we're getting about 1.2 gig, um, which is not bad, but it's latency that's, that's affecting us that processing. We then looked to see if we could build a cloud-like environment in AUT because I found out that we had a virtual uh, blade server sat there which was not heavily utilized and so we looked, we brought one of our big um, storage array systems down, um, put that in the city campus and we just wanted to test can we actually use VM, will they work, can they handle our compute intensive and data intensive uh, processing. Um, it's just an overview of what, it's nothing flash, it's quite a simple little server, um, five blades, 10 gig to connect between the blades. Um, they're normally running five to six virtual machines on each blade and it's running with VMSphere, VMware vSphere version 5.5. So let's try cloud on campus. Um, it works, the VMs could do it. Um, you can see there, by the time we've thrown on the VMs at it, we're up to about 0.8 in speed up. But you'll see on the plot on the right, you can see one of our constraints, and I'll explain that on the next slide. Um, what we worked out is happening is the VMware is trying to share the 10 gigabits across all the VMs. It's not, it has no way that we can allocate dedicated bandwidth to just my VMs. It's trying to load balance. So even though the other VMs are particularly busy uh, and not using much of the network, it's still trying to reserve bandwidth for them. And so as you can see there on that plot, as I added more nodes, my bandwidth is slowly going down. And that's what's holding me up <coughs> in this environment. This is where we went out and we had a chat with our friends at Catalyst. Um, I have a disclaimer here, um, I have no commercial interest in Catalyst. Uh, I'm just a very happy researcher who found a very willing and capable and able um, partner to work with us on this project. So I've got a few slides here from Catalyst that they provided. 
So first of all, they're centres where they're based. So you see they've got a centre in Hamilton, Porarua and Wellington. Now the nice thing is they have worked with Riyadh and we have, not just me but all of you, we have interconnect between Riyadh and Catalyst on a dedicated network link. So we're not competing with anybody, we have a dedicated link between ourselves and Catalyst, which is great. Um, I'm not up with their hardware technology. Um, they sent me this slide, so just to give you an idea of what their um, service are looking like, the sit in their chassis and their storage array system that they've got. Um, I can't really say much more about it. Um, that's, that's sort of a blind part of the catalyst are running. And the nice thing is this, I don't have to worry about care and feed, the capital costs, etc, etc. That's handled by the cloud service provider. And of course they will be upgrading so as time goes by, I don't have the upgrade costs, the upgrade cycle to worry about, that goes with them. Now we move what we have in the AET environment and we put it into the catalyst environment and first of all, can we correlate the data? You know, I'm not trying to get any speed up, it's like, does it work? Do I get, in my terminology, what I call a fringe? And that top plot, the, riot, the red spike, that's what we call a fringe, and that's when radio astronomers, or certainly VLBI radio astronomers, jump up and down and get all excited. So we have the signals correlated. They're in phase, we've adjusted for time, we've adjusted for the Earth orientation parameters, we've got the two signals coherent. Um, bottom right, that plot, um, that's just showing us recovering the uh, radio band, um, or, or bandwidth, between the two antennas. So this worked, and this was Walkworth and Hardy B stop. So I'm confident that this, this works, I'm pleased. Um, fringe quality is five, would it be nice to get eight? We go from zero to eight, don't know why, it's historical. But the signal to noise ratio is really good. So we've got a good fringe there, and we can do some science from that. Um, taking that two station experiment, um, I was experimenting with to see if different storage technologies on the cloud, um, so sorry, different file systems on their storage technology made, made much difference. Um, so I've got ext 4 file system and I created a RAID 0 file system within their storage array system. Um, yes, for a small number of processors it does make a difference, but once we're over five, it's marginal. Um, it's not really making much difference. Um, next, we're taking the six station experiment. Um, we're throwing compute nodes at it, worker nodes, um, and seeing what we get up to. And what we're seeing here is we're plateauing out at about 14 um, compute nodes. So there are other factors at play. There's still more things to be looked at and investigated in this. But the point is, the cloud works for what I want to do. I've got a speed up of 0.6 in this particular scenario. Um, now I want to talk about a technology that I was introduced to by Catalyst called Ansible. Um, it's a scripting language and it allows you to build VMs, break down VMs, customize VMs, um, do your network, change your storage, do your NFS mounts, etc, etc. And we found that this is really, really good. What I do is when I do an experiment, I get what I call, I get for the experiment of X files, so I know how many antennas are involved and how many baselines. So I can work out how many nodes are in. The other thing we thought about is with this, with the cloud, could we actually break the problem up? Can we, can we sort of almost parallelize it, say, based on time? So if I have a 12 hour experiment, can I break it into four hour chunks? And each, each take out each four hours and give it to a different head node. Can I break the problem out that way? And of course, Ansible allows us to do that. Um, so with the work, um, a gentleman called Glenn from uh, Catalyst, uh, we worked on that. Um, so he wrote the scripts and he did some testing. So top left is my idea of how we would break the problem out. Bottom right is off the, um, off the console of uh, Catalyst showing how it's taken that problem and it's generated all the appropriate nodes for it. And here's just to show Ansible working. So at the top there, those are all the nodes it's created, so I can see all the instances. And then down below, um, it is just basic HTOP showing CPU, memory, etc. 
and I can see all the diffx processes. It's too small for you to see on there, but if you sort of look um, on the top of those CPU um, utilization ones, you'll see there's a whole load of processes sat at the top called MFX Core, and they're running flat out. So it scales out, it runs nicely, and that's great. So what we're looking at and what we're discussing with our community is can we shift how we think about data processing for radio astronomy. On the left, we've got the antennas sending data via NRANs to a central correlation site where they have a humongous grade storage system. They have a HPC cluster. They process it, they correlate it, they generate the final data product. The data product goes back through the network to an analysis. It could be set anywhere in the world. What we're talking with our community is, can we change how we look at that? Can we move all that into the cloud? So, the figure we've got down there um, in the right-hand plot, the little red lady, she's the correlator person. She's the person doing the correlation. But she doesn't need to be physically where the correlator is. On the right-hand side, we've got the analysis. He doesn't have to physically be where the data is. So this is something we're working on um, within our community um, to try and implement. Um, just to give you a comparison, we've dedicated HPC hardware. So at the top there, we've got the Porzo Supercomputer Center in Western Australia, Magnus. Um, you can see they threw 288 cores at the same experiment I did, and they got a speed up of four. Um, the next one down, uh, we've got Bonn, Germany. Uh, they threw 480 cores, not exactly the same problem, same experiment, but similar sort of size, and they got a speed up of five. So out of the box, not doing anything, we got 0.6 in the cloud. Using the Ansible idea, we've now got up to 1.2 speed up factor. So that's faster than real time. So at that point, that's good, and I'm happy. Um, and now we need to look on if we can push that a little bit higher. Um, but the point there is that we are not that far behind HPC by using CLAM. So what I'd like to say in summary is, yes, we can correlate in the cloud. We're not far behind HPC computing. Yes, there are trade-offs to going to the cloud. But in terms of the flexibility of being in the cloud, creating nodes on demand, doing my processing, and then tearing it all down at the end, and not having something running and incurring costs, I think it's quite advantageous. Um, and would certainly help with my budgeting. And what I'd like to do is end with a nice picture of New Zealand. Thank you very much. Everybody. Hi, I'm Jensen and from Nessie. Uh, have you thought about using uh, Nessie HPC infrastructure for it? But simple answer no. I don't know what this can provide. I've got contact with this. Right, so, uh, okay. Um, how often do you receive observations? At the moment, we are still experimenting and demonstrating our capability to the community. But I would envisage from March this year, we would probably have one to two experiments per week. Right, and uh, D uh, DFX is a uh, major uh, engine for it. It is for this particular, there are other software providers out there, but that's the one we're using because it supports the geodetic right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was just wondering how much automation you have in the process. I, so I don't I understand all the details of the correlation workflow, but um, uh, um, is it conceivable that uh, the telescope um, uh, you basically observe the data and then it's completely automatically correlated, uh, so that the, the user basically just needs to program the telescope and gets the data delivered at the end? So um, technically, that's possible. Um, there's a known organization in Europe called Drive, um, they're based in Holland. They do that in its routine. Unfortunately, in this neck of the woods, uh, ourselves and Australians, etc., we're not that sophisticated yet. But yet, that's what I'd like to know. Uh, Dr. Basco, Nancy, again. <laughs> um, I was wondering what is limiting you, the scalability? Uh, like I've seen in one of the slides, it's up to 14 nodes, and if you go further, you get the same speed up. 
So, do you know anything else to consider? At the moment, no. So, I'm simply going to work on our friends from Catalyst and see if we've got any options for them. But since Sporting is now in the world, I've got a non messy question if you can squeeze one in. Time's <laughs> 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 thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you.